when we think of hope in Jesus Christ, our speakers today are doing just that. They are bringing hope to an area that, uh, of ministry that we don't often think about. They, their ministry is Night Angels. We have Melvin and Twyla Beggett with us today. And uh, the reality is their ministry, anti-human trafficking, we think of that somewhere else, maybe down in the inner city or someplace else. We're going to find out it's in our own back door. And uh, Melvin and Twyla are with us today just to share their heart because we want to be part of what God is doing in the earth. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks to everyone who got us here, especially... uh, Shelly Lewis Walsh. She's a special individual. Uh, I was in a meeting like this about five years ago, and I was getting ready to retire. I had had a career with Ford Motor Company and a spinoff of theirs called Roosh Steel Company and then Severstall. It was a, a steel maker in Dearborn, and we had grown the company to be about a $10 billion steel company here. I was the vice president of human resources. I had a great job. I was a workaholic. And I had decided it was time to retire. And I thought retirement at the time was a condo in Traverse City and a boat in Miami. That's what I wanted. I had dreamed about that for years. And my wife had retired. She was a Christian school teacher at Bethesda Christian School, which Shelley went to. And that's how we got to know her so many years ago. But I went to a meeting like this. And somebody told me about human trafficking. And part of my job in the steel industry was for my company, I, was, I handled public relations, media relations, uh, communications, and I did a lot of reading, a lot of clip sheets that people prepared for me, and I, w- I knew a little, about, a little bit of information about a lot of subjects that could affect the steel industry or not. And somebody started talking about human trafficking, and uh, my first thought was, well, that's a problem in South America, or that's a problem in Thailand, or that's a problem in Eastern Europe, or somewhere else, but it's, it's not something I should be concerned about. And when, when somebody told me that it exists here, not south of 8 Mile, <laughs> but north of 8 Mile too, I was a Detroiter. I had grown up in Detroit. I went to Detroit Public Schools. I went to Wayne State University. I worked in Dearborn for the majority of my work life. And somebody said this is a Detroit problem. It cut me to the core. I had to get involved. And fortunately, when God does things in our family, he does it to both of us, which is, a, which is a gift. My wife and I had done virtually every job in the church. My mom, pulled, my mom literally dragged me as a young man to church, and we had been in church all of our lives. And we had a born-again experience in 1984, and we recommitted our lives. And we've, done every, we've been in the nursery department to first grade, she was a Christian school teacher. I've been a deacon and elder. I'm a trustee in my church. I mean, we had done all the jobs in the church. And I wasn't really sure that I was prepared academically or experientially to step out of the, out of the walls of a church and speak for Jesus Christ. But we did. And two years ago, we've been doing this for five years, two years ago, we started this organization called Night Angels, and we have about 25 members on our team, and we do four things. We do awareness like this, we come out and talk to groups, and we tell them about the scourge of of human trafficking. We do assistance, and that is really the main main, uh, thrust of our organization. We We do outreach. We go and look for victims. We go to the streets. We look for people that we believe are victimized. We feed them. We give them hygiene kits. We rescue them, and then we try to get them help and back to the plan and purpose that God has for their lives. We do advocacy. (laughs) We go to to, uh, the court system with them. We 
we take them down their path of problems, and believe me, their problems are many. And then the last, the last thing that we do, we, are, we believe we have a model. Jesus has given us a model of, Jesus has given us a model of how to do this. And we're prepared to facilitate other groups and other areas because there's plenty of work to do in this, in this area to do what we do. Go ahead, next slide. This is the Bible scripture, which is the cornerstone of what we do. And it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not har to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. That is the cornerstone. We believe the trafficking victims are not in the purpose are not in the purpose that God has for them. Human trafficking is the second largest criminal enterprise in the world. Um, we think now, and you, the, the data is not good in the world of human trafficking because victims don't self-identify. So we don't know how many there are. Some, pe some of the experts in the field say there's probably 50 million victims in the world today. We believe that there's well over a million victims here in the United States. And I can attest to this, we've probably met 2,500 victims that we've met working, doing what we do for the last five years. 80% are women and 50% are children. Go ahead, next slide. Hard to believe, Detroit, Detroit is a wonderful city, and as I, no, no one in the world is a better advocate for the city than I am. I believe in the city, I've always believed in the city, even in its darkest day. But we are a hub of human trafficking. And the reason is, we are an automotive giant. There's a lot of commerce into and out of the city. We have a, we have a geographical location close to Canada where trafficking victims are pour in from Eastern Europe. And we're also at a major north-south roadway, I-75, and we're at a major hub of an east-west thoroughfare, which is the Ohio Turnpike. So Detroit is a hub both in both directions, victims coming and victims going. Next slide. I want to tell you a story, and I'll try to make this story quick. Someday I'm going to write a book about it, but I'm going to tell you about Paula. I'm going to get her name right. I can't tell you the right name. Paula. Paula was nine years old, and she had been in over 30 foster care homes. Think about that. Before the age of nine. Before the age of nine. In her last foster care home, she was being physically abused, raped by her foster father. And I think about myself at nine years old. I was playing Little League Baseball, counting my baseball cards, playing with my chemistry set. But at nine years old, she chose to run away. She chose to run away from that abuse and that harshness that she was living in, that chaos. She took off. And the problem is she didn't have a plan. Nine-year-old nine year girls don't have plans. Nineteen-year-old girls don't have plans usually. And she ran away. She got picked up by a trafficker. The trafficker took her, groomed her, and she worked in the world of child pornography for about nine years. Think about that. She made pornographic films for nine years. I can't imagine the abuse, the emotional trauma, the physical trauma of that. Now, at age 18, she got too old to do that, and the man who was generating the child pornography where she was working sold her to a pimp. A pimp is a man who is engaged in the work of selling girls for commercial sex. And he sold her for many years, and she worked in that life for many years, many, many years. She, she went all over the country because this was a, what, you know, this was a high-class escort service. And she got married, and she got away from that life. She married a man. She raised a family. She has four kids, four kids, four kids who became professionals. But her husband died. When her husband died, 
she, she fell back into a drug problem that she had in these early years. She contracted first breast cancer, then she contracted bone cancer, and one night in Detroit we met her. She lives, she, she lived at the time probably six miles from here. We met her, to make a long story short, we were able to help her, to reach out to her. And there is an incredible turnaround in her life. And the reason I tell you her story, it's a composite of so many stories, so many similar stories that we hear about. And up here on this slide, what I've got is a hierarchy that the Lord gave us, gave Twyla and I, out of our experience of meeting 2,500 victims. And you can see on the top is pornography. And I can do 45 minutes on pornography without taking a breath. I'll say only this this morning. Anyone who is engaging in pornography or using pornography and think it's safe and it doesn't hurt anybody, that's a lie from you know where. When you click and watch a video or look at an image on the internet, you are supporting human trafficking because most people who are victimized in that world are trafficking victims. And what happens is, is they dovetail in a, t in a tailspin, I should say. They go in a tailspin in this world of human trafficking from the top of this paradigm to the bottom. And I'm not going to go through all of them. They're self-explanatory. But you need to understand it. And you need to understand, and this is something that I had trouble as a man putting my arms around, even as a Christian man. No woman engages, or man engages in prostitution because they want to. They're victims. They have been victimized. If you'd have met Paula, like we did, the first reaction might have been, well, she's this or she's that. A policeman might have said, she's this or this, she's that. Or a nurse in an ER might have said, she's this or she's that. But she was a human trafficking victim. And her story took her through most of those layers of that paradigm to where we met her. And where we met her, we work with victims on the, at the bottom of that paradigm. The people that we deal with are engaged in street prostitution, and they, are, they weigh 85 pounds, soaking wet, with a high humidity rate. They're emaciated. They, they have abscesses all over their bodies from from uh, injection sites in their, in, their, in, their, in their bodies where they've been using heroin or, or other kinds of drugs over the years. Missing they teeth. Are, go ahead. Missing teeth. Missing teeth. Their hair is falling out. But Jesus has taken us out there to go onto the street and to introduce him into their life, to feed them and to give them hygiene kits. And I understand that's what you're going to be making today. And we give them gloves and scarves and flip-flops in the summer and umbrellas and all kinds of crazy things to try to make their lives a little bit easier. But what we try to do is to build trust with them so that they'll ultimately trust us enough because they don't trust, they don't trust many people in the world because of what's happened to them. That they'll raise their hand and say, I'm ready to go. Help me. Jesus, take me. And there's no better feeling than to know God has taken Paula off those streets after all those years and seeing her raising her hands, worshiping Jesus Christ. Next slide. We work with women who are working in prostitution. 80% of the girls we meet and we talk to live outside the city, have lived and grown up. I live in Sterling Heights at 17 Mile and Shaner, if you know where that's at. We just rescued a young lady who lived at 21 Mile and Romeo Plank Road, which is even farther out in the boondocks than where we live. We see every ethnicity. We see every socioeconomic background. We see every age. We see, we see girls coming from all states. 
crazy things happen. Girls go on road trips, have a falling out with their girlfriends in the car, get out of the car, don't know what to do, and end up with us because they get picked up by traffickers and they end up on the streets. We also identify, we also work with people who identify as transgender. That's a special, special group, and I could talk about that group, but they are, they are, you can say what you want about people who are transgender, but they are the targets of hate crimes. Most of the transgender people that we have met over the years have been victims of shootings, knifings, assault, robbery, end up dead, end up in wheelchairs. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You got it. How do victims become victims? That's probably a question you have. It was a question I had. Vulnerability creates the opportunity for the trafficker to <clears throat> groom and to get a hold of and control an individual. That can happen because of gender. It can become poverty, being an orphan, orphan a single mo mother, lack of work or education, being, uh, being in the minority community, a dis being in, having a disability of some kind, runaway, foster care, sexual abuse. One of the big things that we see are, are girls that graduate from the foster care system. Think about this. I have two daughters, both very successful, but at 18 years old, I don't think they could have survived very well on their own very long. They both went to college, but I think about that a foster, a kid in, a, in the foster care system has to graduate at age 18 and, and go out on their own. And the traffickers are there waiting. And you say, how do they do it? They're experts at it. They know how to seize on, on girls getting out of the foster care system. They're there waiting for them. We, we've seen them hovering around institutions where foster care children are being housed. They take one step out of the foster care, out of the institute. Vista Maria is an example uh, where we've seen that happen on the west side of Detroit on Warren Avenue and your outer drive. And the, the traffickers are waiting in the neighborhoods, waiting for the girls to, to come out or get out, and, and they become groomed and, and abused. Okay. Go ahead. Ready. So I'll give you a little bit of information with regard to the neighborhoods that we are in right now. The first thing that happens to a girl is that her identification is taken away from her. It makes you feel worthless. You can't seem to do anything, ladies, if you go to Kroger's and you forgot your purse at home, right? So the same thing happens to these women on the streets. All their identification is taken away from them. Oftentimes they are given a new name. Now this is like honey or peaches or sugar, something like that, and they're no longer allowed to use their own name. The reason for that is if somebody is looking for them, say they've been reported as a missing person, then, then it would be too identifiable to somebody else. So the trafficker will not allow them to use their own name anymore. They are branded. Branded is just like you do a cow or a pig, something hot like a coat hanger is, is they get it very hot and then they put it right on the girl's skin. We're seeing it on their, on their shoulders and on their thighs. We're also seeing tattoos. Now, not to say anything bad about tattoos because I know a lot of people have those these days. But these kinds of tattoos have the trafficker's name like across them, just like that. Um, so every time they look in the mirror, that's what they see. We're also seeing branding marks that are tattoo marks that look like barcodes. The old way, old way two years ago, used to be right here on their wrist. This is like you see on a can of corn, okay? But now they're doing it behind here, okay? We actually saw one of these at Dearborn Federal Credit Union not too long ago. Quite interesting. Again, it's to identify somebody's property because you are owned by somebody else. Our friends are expected to earn a nightly quota. If they don't make their nightly quota, they are severely beaten. This girl here had an ax taken to her head. That's severe. Next slide, please. And she was from West Bloomfield. Yes. This is the kind of house that the girls are living in called a crack house or a trap house. You might have heard that term, okay? They would be able to live in this trap house at night 
for an additional $7. So they're earning their money, their quota, they earn their drug money, and then they have to earn enough money to lay on the floor of this place, okay? In our neighborhood, it's seven to $10 to lay on that floor where there's no heat, no electricity, no furniture. There's no dresser to put your clothes in. They will also sleep in car washes, and we're talking about the spray car washes. They'll do their laundry there, or we'll see them in the laundry mats when the, we give them hygiene kits. They'll take them to either a McDonald's or something like a, some kind of a fast food and try to get cleaned up. So sometimes you see somebody cleaning up in a fast food place. Don't take offense to it. That might be all that they had. Look at that picture. Where do they go to the restroom if there's no water? Where do you go to the restroom? Think about it. See those weeds? That's where you go. Not a lot of privacy. Next slide, please. So let's put a little hope into this. <laughs> we are assistants. We call ourselves boots on the ground. We take out a team of four people in our SUV, and we have another two people minimum that are on duty. We call our home team. We have a lot of safety measures. We don't have time to go into all that. But what we do is we share life with people that are on the streets. We learn them. We learn their families. We learn what their concerns are. And we develop relationships and develop that hope. Next slide. This is what we call bait and switch. We take out lunches, we take out hygiene kits, but the most important thing we do is we pray with them. As soon as we see them, we say, what can we pray for you today? And I tell you, as soon as, as, soon as we pull up to a new girl, she wants to push away from the prayer thing. But before you know it, they are coming up to the window and they've got their prayer requests ready because they know we're going to be there every Monday night between 7 and 9 o'clock. And they're ready for us. They've got a list of things they want prayer for. And it's through those prayer requests that we learn them. We've got our cards that we hand them. And it's a 24-7 phone number that when they are good and ready to get off the street, to get some help, to get out of that life and to get onto the plan and purpose God has for them, they call that phone number. We've had 34 rescues in the last two and a half years. 17 of those were this year. Praise God. He is working out there. Next slide, please. Okay. So then we go into the advocacy mode. We get that phone call, and let me tell you, everything stops at the Baggett household when that phone number rings. <laughs> So please don't call that phone number if you have a book report you need to do. Um, it's a safe, and we, we provide a safe and efficient rescue. This is safe for us and safe for them as well. We have to come up with something that works for both. And then we have to go into a ton of red tape, and this is the hardest thing that we do, is to find a place that they can go to so that they can detox without identification. Remember, we just talked about that. No identification. How do you know who this person is? How can you take them to a hospital when they don't even have their ID? It's very, very difficult, but you know who knows? The Lord knows, and he has not failed yet to get these girls help. First thing we have to do, as Mel said, is detox them because in the neighborhood we're in, they are on usually crack crack cocaine as well as heroin, and unfortunately the heroin is laced with carfentanil as well as Xanax, which is eating the girls from the inside out, to be honest with you. There's very few detox centers that will take them in that condition. Then we get on to rehabilitation. If we have our way, every one of them would go to Grace Centers of Hope in Pontiac, which is a Christian-based one-year program, and it can go three years and beyond. That's our plan for them. But that's not the plan for everybody. That won't work for everyone. So we have to work with that as well. And once they're in rehab, we have a mentoring program. So we stay connected with them because 
they're having to find a new playground, new playthings, new playmates. And we are good playmates for them. We don't want them going back to their old playmates. So we stay connected with them. Parents, and I know I see a bunch of you going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. This is what you have to do. When your kid goes to bed at night, go and check your kid and make sure they're in their beds. There's a very famous story of a young lady in Birmingham that was trafficked out of her house to Novi in Northville. And she snuck out of her bed at night and she snuck back in before school the next morning. And her parents had no clue she was gone. Look, when you go to bed, make sure your kid is in their bed. Talk to them about Snapchat. If your kid's got Snapchat on their phone, get it off of there. Talk to them about Facebook and sexting. You have to open up these doors. I grew up in a generation where the parents didn't even say sex, let alone say it in a sanctuary this beautiful. But you have to talk to your kids about the dangers of this. You need a family cell phone tracking. Our team uses cell phone tracking. We've got people watching us. If our car does not move in seven minutes, they are on the phone with us. They're watching us. You can do that with your kid's cell phone. Know your friend's parents and get to know their phone numbers and their contacts, not just that they went with Joey and you got Joey's phone number. You need Joey's parents' phone numbers. You need to know who they are. You need a security system. Mel is big on this <laughs> because you don't, you don't know if your kids got out or not. You need, a, you need a buzzer that's going to go off if they walk out the door during the night. You need to know this. Raise your guard. Be a nosy neighbor. Be that one that everybody says, oh, there she is again. She's watching us. You need to be that person. Okay. Where does this happen? Where do your kids go? Think about that. They go to the malls. They go to the libraries. They go to social media. They're going to the grocery stores and school. Guess what? In our neighborhood, pimps and drug dealers are 16 years old, and they ride bicycles. You don't want your daughter dating an older boy. That's a big sign, big age differences. These are other high-risk areas that you want to look at. Nail salons. I was getting my nails done, and there was a girl came in there. She was being trafficked, and I knew it. I knew it. I was able to slide her a card. There was an older man that brought her in, and he was grooming her. She was in the grooming process. Next slide, please. So these are signs of sex trafficking, things to look for. Mel and I see this in our community. You need to know these things so you can look for this in your community as well. Next slide. If you're in the medical field of any sort, social workers, dentists, nurses, know these kinds of things. This is signs. Next slide, please. Other signs. Read some of those. Get them down inside you. Locks on doors, on the outside, yes, it exists. We have seen this. Pimps will lock up the girl and put a lock on. Put them in a, in a warehouse or in a house and put a lock on the outside of a door. That's a big sign. What do you do if you find it? Call that number. Take your cell phones out. Put that in there. That is the human trafficking number. We had a call last week from a girl in Ohio. She was stuck. I don't have any contacts in Ohio. We haven't got that far yet, but I knew to refer her there, and that's what you could do too. You could also call the local police, or you can call us, and that's our 24-hour number. 
so feel free to pick that up. We have them out in, this, out in the corridor as well, if you would like to have that phone number to keep in your pocket. Next slide, please. These are just ways you can help us. And Pastor, back to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Melvin and Twyla, and thank you for your ministry. The Apostle Paul said that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save or to rescue sinners of whom I am the chief. And I think about your ministry as rescue this morning, and you are certainly carrying out the mandate and the mission, the incarnate mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, thank you for sharing. Thank you for serving where you served there on Michigan Avenue between Livernois and Wyoming, some of the devastated areas in that place. I know it's not easy, but thank you for being willing. And you can know that, that Hilltop will pray for you Amen? Amen. And maybe you want to talk to them this morning. We actually have a very special ministry here that's part of this anti-human trafficking. Shelley Walsh, would you come? And we have an opportunity this next week, besides praying for this ministry that was presented to Night Angels this morning, to, uh, to contribute. Tell us a little bit. So good morning, and thank you guys, um, to Mel and Twyla, for coming and speaking with us. Um, they have a special place in my heart, personally and, and professionally. And so we'd really like to, as a congregation, continue to um, build our, um, our connections in the community with them. And out in the foyer, um, some of our MAP team members, we have these gallon-sized plastic bags. Um, Inside the plastic bag, there is a note um, that says to fill it with one pair of socks, one pair of gloves, some food items that are non-perishable. These are bags that are going to be given out onto the streets. There's also um, an idea in here for a $5 gift card to any food restaurant, such as McDonald's or Taco Bell, Wendy's. Um, if they do run out of food bags, and every time they go out on Monday, they have the snack bags and they have a sandwich in here. If they run out of sandwiches, then they need to go to McDonald's to get cheeseburgers or chicken nuggets, something that's substantial. Um, talking and working with them for the past year, um, I do know that sometimes this is all the girls get, is this bag on a Monday. And I can't imagine only eating on one day, one meal. You know, in my household, we get hangry if we are not eating lunch by one. Um, so I can't imagine not eating. Um, I hope that this message today has spoken to you. There's so much brokenness out there, and I think sometimes even just a small bag can speak volumes of Christ's love through us. And so if you guys could stop in the back, if we do run out of bags, is there a gallon-sized bag? Fill it with love, fill it with hope, we're going to bring them back here next Sunday, and our team are going to give it to Mel and Twyla and pray over the bags. Pray with your family. Pr talk about this with your coworkers. Let them know that, you know, your church did something very ostentatious this weekend, and they brought a speaker out that was um, just filled with love. Don't let this be the last time you talk about human trafficking. And if you do have any questions, um, we will be in the back answering questions. Um, MAP here for no, our, our Northville um, group, we do meet on Thursdays, um, the first Thursday of every month. So our next meeting is going to be November, or excuse me, December 2nd, I believe. Um, so if you do have questions about it, please feel free to ask in the back. And that meeting is here? It is here in room 300. Yes. Thank you, Shelley, and thank you for your your heart. 